So would you please welcome, from the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum, a docent and an SR-71 instructor, pilot, Mr. Buzz Carpenter. Buzz. Thanks, David. It's indeed a privilege to be with you today, and I always enjoy these forums. Now, I can see with the lighting, I'm not going to be able to see too much of you. Uh, just quickly, I was in the Air Force for uh, 28 years. I flew the SR-71 from 1975 until 1981. I uh, was kind of in the mid-year group, consider that the airplane was active. First flight, test flight, was in December of 64. The last operational flight was in the fall of 89. I'm going to walk you through a, a briefing, and hopefully I don't use any terms that you don't understand, and kind of give you an overview of where the Blackbirds come from, uh, the creativity and the development of them, and their use, and of course now uh, their role in museums, both here in the United States and one overseas in England. Quick outline. President Eisenhower had a big dilemma. The Soviet Union was a closed body. How do we keep track of what they're doing? The development of nuclear weapons, the fielding of bombers, of missiles. So he directed, and Kelly Johnson and Lucky Skunk Works created the U-2, which was the first airplane specifically designed to do overflights and information collection. His first overflight was in July 1956 over Moscow. Within a fairly short time period, there were a couple more overflights, and it was determined that the new surface-to-air missiles that the Russians were developing could reach an airplane like a U-2 that flew at 70,000 feet at 450 miles an hour and it was fairly easy to see on radar. We never expected the Russians to be looking at 70,000 feet. We thought their radar scan pattern would be basically up to about 50,000 feet and not above. The president asked for a commission headed by the CIA. The Air Force joined in. They came back in 1957 and said, we need a replacement airplane. We're trying to put a camera in space, but it's really not working. It was called the Corona Project. So two companies got into competition, the then Corvair, or Convair, I'm sorry, not Corvair, that was the car I had, Corvette. Um, Convair and Lockheed, 1958. They matured the designs. Summer of 1959, Lockheed won the competition, and it would go forward become the A-12. One of the really interesting things in Kelly Johnson's sense of humor, he named the project Oxcart. Can you imagine anything that is further from what was created? Basically what the president asked for, I want an airplane that flies at 85,000 feet and above. I want, we need one that flies at 2100 miles an hour, Mach 3 plus, and we want to create America's first stealthy airplane. President Eisenhower's greatest concern was that if Khrushchev could get his hands on one of these airplanes, he would consider it an act of war. So we wanted an airplane that they couldn't see on radar. Well, we came pretty close, but there is no airplane that is absolutely unseen. Oh, that's, a, that's a laser. This is Kelly Johnson, born and raised in Michigan, University of Michigan grad. Probably one of the giants in aircraft design of the 20th century. He and Jack Northrop and a couple others truly led the Lockheed Skunk Works. He was involved with the design of almost 30 different airplanes. You can see here, one of his first jobs was redesigned the Electra for Amelia Earhart. He had nothing to do with the loss of the airplane. If you don't have a navigator worth anything, you can, you can get lost very easily. The P-38 was the first all-Kelly design, probably one of our finest fighters in World War II. The Hudson Bomber, which was basically a derivative of the Electra that the British bought because they were so in need of aircraft for World War II. Our first jet, the P-40, 
as you can see, was built in 143 days. Kelly was an amazing man who surrounded himself with uh, very productive engineers. I treasure the time I had with Kelly a number of times. He was a tough customer. Actually, I was glad I was the customer because the people that worked for him, he was quite demanding, but they loved working for him because they created things. You didn't spend years trying to do something. Kelly and his team got things out the door that were important to America. You see the CIA contract, 32 months after President Eisenhower gave the go-ahead, the first A-12 flew out in a place called Area 51. Now, people for years have known it's been out there, but it wasn't until two years ago that the Air Force finally said I could say something. I'm also an Area 51 person, so I'm glad I could finally talk about it. The SR-71 first flew in 1964, and its last flight you see is in 89. These are the aircraft. There were 13 of these single-seat A-12s, and I give those men a lot of credit. They were Air Force pilots on loan. It was a much less sophisticated system than I would have the privilege to fly in the SR-71. They did not have a astro inertial, a star tracking system. Those were just a standard one. And I can't imagine flying the airplane, doing the refuelings, talking on the radio when you had to, turning on the cameras at the right time, doing the defensive system. That's why I was glad to have two of us in the airplane so we could share the responsibilities. There were 12. When I do high school groups, or sometimes even younger, in my pocket I have a slide rule. Kids often ask me, where do you put the batteries? And I said, I'm a dinosaur. When I went through engineering, we used these things. We called them a slip stick. You have many different names. But this is one of the last major airplanes. And years later, they went back in and did the design using a computer. And they found out that the marginal difference was so slight that it really would have had no impact on the airplane. We lost... 12. And why do we lose 12? Well, today, when we build something, practically anything, you use computers to tell you how is it going to perform. So you have a lot of knowledge before you go out. If you were one of Kelly Johnson's test pilots, you had to take the airplane out in steps and hope that you brought it back. Because there were parts of it flying it that we didn't know that you couldn't fly it there. The wonderful thing about it, there are very few fatalities. In the A-12, there were three deaths, which is obviously we don't look forward to deaths. Uh, one of them, two of them in the test program and one in operations. The SR-71, my wife really liked this airplane because she knew I enjoyed flying it. But the other part was we had a magnificent rocket ejection seat and we never had an Air Force fatality. Got to a point that the airplane was no longer flyable, which we considered the airplane a national asset. We could exit safely and work the fly another day. We talked about the slide rule. Because of the heat picture we're going to look at here shortly, the airplane had to be made of titanium. The United States does not have any titanium. So the CIA set up a frontal organization in Europe, and we bought enough titanium for 50 airplanes. All the Russians wanted was money. They never knew where that titanium was going. And then later on, some of these airplanes would come to visit. Now, we never overflew Russia, but we would sit right on their border and at times look at least 100 miles inbound. It was America's first stealthy airplane. Again, that was one of the big things that President Eisenhower was most concerned about. He wanted to make sure we could achieve the best we could do. We had a fleet of tankers, because you'll see we carried about 12,400 gallons of fuel, but we consumed that in two hours. So every two hours, we came down from 85,000 feet down to 25,000 feet and would hook up behind a tanker then go back up, or we come down to land, per se. The fuel is special. 
If I had a bucket of JP7 here today, it would kind of, the smell would remind you of jet fuel. But I could take somebody from the audience here and give you a blowtorch, and we wouldn't have to leave the auditorium. Because normal fuel ignites at minus 40 degrees. JP7 is very stable, so it does not ignite until you get it above 335 degrees, which is ideal for operating the airplane. This shows you my cockpit window right here is 620 degrees, 580. My navigators is about 480. Back here, it's over 1,200 degrees. The airplane grows three to four inches in length, an inch or two in width because of heating. If the airplane that you have, 968, was on the floor, you would see it's loosely put together. It has to be able to expand as it heats up. paint is special. Part of it, if you can see the curve to the earth, 97% of the atmosphere is below you. The sky is black. So if you're down below, because that's where you're going to be, and you're looking up, you're looking up at a black airplane. But the most important reason, some of you probably have cabins, or maybe in your house, you have a potbelly stove. It's black, I'm sure because black is the best radiating color. And so we want to try to get as much of that heat off the airplane into that minus 55 degrees, which is about minus 80 degrees Fahrenheit air. So by painting the airplane black, it reduces the skin temperature by about 50 degrees. Also in the paint is small ferrite particulates that causes the radar to be slightly absorbed before it's reflected. The glass is like your oven. It's about an inch and a half thick. In the airplane, even in my spacesuit, I could only hold my hand against the window for about five seconds because the heat radiating through uh, clearly would go through my glove and everything else. The fuel is solid. When you come out, you had to preheat the engines to make sure the oil was liquid before you started. This is all a special material. 20% of the surface is radar absorbing material. And that would allow us, when we were flying over the United States, that if we turned off our transponder that all the airplanes have, FAA at that point most of the time would not see us. Obviously, its main purpose is when we were flying over adversaries that they would have a very difficult time seeing us on radar because we're not transmitting at all. The SR-71 is America's first lifting body. If you look up here, the forward, from this forward, looks like the shape of a boat. 35% of the lift of the airplane comes from the boat hull. Because even though the air pressure is 0.4 pounds, when you're traveling at 2,100 miles an hour, the nose is up about 6 degrees, and it's cruising much like your boat on the lake. It compresses the air. It allows us to fly at a higher altitude. We can do steeper bank turns. And what do I mean by a steeper bank turn? 45 degrees is all we could do. So if we come at Virginia the right way, we could turn it around in Virginia. When we get up in the Northeast, we got to go through a number of states because it's 175 miles to get this airplane turned around. It likes to fly straight and fast. You've already heard about the sound of Freedom. That's when we use the sonic boom. The boom is always there. But sometimes we were tasked by the State Department to overfly heads of state to remind them they were doing things that were counter uh, to U.S. policy. Everything on the airplane was recorded. The first, uh, because the airplane was so sophisticated, it actually took quite a bit of maintenance. In flight, it actually performed quite well. But there were about 650 points on the airplane that were constantly being monitored. Some of them every couple of seconds. I think our engines were being recorded every half a second. And believe it or not, sometimes that wasn't fast enough. Anytime you moved a switch, anything you said, it was all recorded. 
It was the intent was really for maintenance to understand when the airplane was on the ground, it was not hot. What were the problems that the pilot and navigator were seeing in flight? These are these are called good tires. That's the best tires you get. You get about 15 landings, 425 pounds per square inch of nitrogen. Because if you put oxygen in there, or not oxygen, if you put normal air in there, the oxygen in the air, because of the heat, would go into the rubber. So when you came back from a flight, you'd have flat tires. So these tires were filled with nitrogen to prevent that. Of the 12 airplanes we lost, tire failure was the primary cause in three of them. And then the fourth one was a strong competitor or contributor to the accident, which happened to be right in front of the squadron that I happened to be flying in Kadena, Okinawa, Japan. This is a production line down at Burbank. Uh, the airplane obviously was very secret. President Johnson made an announcement in uh, June of 1964 of the existence of these airplanes. They used a, an interceptor test version they were using to show the public because the SR-71s had not yet flown. When you build a stealthy vehicle, it's inherently unstable. So many of you who fly, or most of you who have flown on an airplane, this center column, this is how you measure airspeed. The air pressure here versus the pressure on the side tells you how fast you're going. The side probe, we call the beta probe, it's got a probe in the top and the bottom. These are holes because this airplane is unstable in pitch and in yaw. So it doesn't matter if you're hand flying the airplane or it's an autopilot. In the background, there's a computer keeping this airplane in limits. And that's the purpose of the side probe here. As the air comes across it, it detects that the airplane is starting to diverge from where you want it. Not so modern a cockpit. I came out of uh, what was photo reconnaissance F4s, and I thought, I'm going into a supersonic airplane. I bet it's really not a great cockpit. Wrong. Kelly Johnson said, I've got so many problems. If it works, I'm not going to mess with it. So this is a typical round dial of aircraft at that time. That you were, this is all the supersonic controls, obviously. But one of the big additions, they filmed our mission on 35 millimeter film. And in that display there, it advanced at our ground speed. So I would be getting a turn point that would tell me what the heading what time they expected us there, how much fuel I should have, other things like that that I needed. So the cockpit is really small, and to be sitting in a cockpit trying to hold a map and read where you're supposed to turn next, uh, I think would have been rather challenging to say the least. Now one of the things they added later, and I did some of the test flights, because at night, with a beautiful starry sky and the sky, lights down below. Sometimes it was hard to tell which way was up. So they developed a laser system, kind of like Star Wars. Because when you fly at night, up until this time, your whole attention was on your attitude indicator. Now we created a laser that came right across here. So as you move the aircraft around, you had a reference laser. You could see turns. You could see when the airplane started to climb. It was really a huge help. Uh, to the pilots who flew after I left the program. This is the back seater. He has a much bigger display because he's got the navigation. He turns on the cameras that need to be turned on and turned off. He has the defensive systems. If we're talking on the radio once we leave and get to altitude, he's doing the talking on the radio. And he also figures out the descent. Because from 85,000 feet, you got to start back 200 some odd miles. It takes you about 10 minutes to slow the airplane and cool it to get it down to 25,000, either to prepare to land or to prepare to refuel. The forward antennas here, and you see the blisters on your airplane. We were always looking forward. We really weren't concerned that somebody was going to sneak up behind us. 
you know, this is not uh, the Roadrunner type of deal coming up behind the uh, Wiley Coyote. Down here, these are the jammers. These were some of the most powerful jammers of the time. And I see many of the people in the audience today, you probably all remember when we used to have TV antennas. So we were prohibited from turning these systems on only in certain parts of the United States. Because if I flew over your house, even at 85,000 feet, you'd probably lose your TV coverage for 10 to 20 seconds. And the local sheriff would be getting a lot of calls on what caused the disruption. So we were careful not to run them uh, randomly. And sometimes when we did overflights, particularly Cuba and other places, we knew the Russians only had part of their equipment. And they would try to play with us. So we would inactivate parts of our defensive system so they would have no idea if they fired a missile at us how we were going to defeat that missile. These are the antennas for just regular talking, but also as we approach the time that we're looking for a tanker, we use this antenna and another antenna, and we could, quote, see three the 350 miles in front of us where our tankers were and they had a special code in, we had a code. The outside world all they heard was a bunch of uh, static electricity but it told me where the tanker was and the bearing from where I was so I could make correction. When I have kids, I just love to ask them, have you seen Star Wars? What do you think of R2-D2? Is that one of your friends? I love r 2 That's exactly right. Why? Just for you, that's our R2-D2. It weighs 800 pounds, because think about it back in the 60s and 70s. Computers weren't small. This is the master computer. This came from England. We call this the magic eye. Just like R2-D2 R2 knew where he was, we knew where we were. In the hangar, on the floor, the U.S. Geodetic Survey had marked exactly where this was in the face of the Earth. Two hours before we would come out to start the engines, the technicians would be out there telling our master computer where it is, loading the mission, loading the camera, loading all the information that we needed. We would start engines, and when we pulled out of the hangar, on a day like today, within 30 seconds, the special sensor would look through the blue sky and walk on the stars. Now think about this. This is in the 60s and the 70s. We guaranteed the president 300 feet anywhere in the world traveling at 2,200 miles an hour. So we were not dependent on anything on the ground. So an adversary couldn't try to fool us with a false signal or anything else because we were navigating off the stars. JP-7, remember I told you it's hard to start. It will not start with an electric ignition. So we used a chemical called triethylene boring, affectionately called TEB. Each engine had an individual tank of TEB. It was good for 16 shots into the engine. When we started the engines, as you see here, a shot of TEB would come in. That's 3,000 degrees. It was a very toxic. I think the EPA today would give us a lot of grief. But it beautifully lit the fuel. Once the fuel was burning, it burned wonderfully. You may have heard in the last couple of years we've been testing hypersonic vehicles off the west coast of the United States. Those are vehicles that fly at Mach 5. We're trying to get them to Mach 7. They use JP-7 because JP-7 is very stable fuel at higher temperatures. This is what the engine looks like. Originally a Navy engine, modified. This is the fourth stage compressor. There are six bypass tubes. So at the higher speeds, you heard in the film that the faster we went, the less fuel we burned. That's counterintuitive. But what happens, these engines become ramjets. A ramjet is the most efficient way you can burn fuel. So. At 2,150 miles an hour, 82% of our thrust is going around. 82% is going around this engine here where it's burning. It's going directly into the afterburner. So it is so much more efficient. The 
core is 2,000 degrees. This is 3,400 degrees. You could almost feel like you could, when you're standing by this, you could feel the heat, which almost felt like you could look, look through that afterburner section. And we stayed in afterburner for an hour and a half at a time. There's not engines today that can withstand these kind of temperatures. And these were built back in the 60s and the 70s. Absolutely amazing Pratt Whitney uh, engines. A perfectly tuned engine had 13 of these jewels, as we called them. This is an area where a little more fuel burns. It didn't quite get burned here. And the air is slowing because it's coming out very supersonic. And it's eventually going to be somewhere back here at wherever the wind drift at that altitude is. No engine can absorb supersonic air. So we have to adjust the air when you hit about 1.6 Mach, which is a little over 1,000 miles an hour, so that the compressors can absorb that air. As we hit 1,000 miles an hour, the spike is going to start back. This is a subsonic position. I'll show you a, a, a uh, model here in a second. This is going to go back 26 inches, more than double the size of the, of the opening, but the back is going to become compressed. You see here, this is subsonic. This is what the spike looks like. The spike is forward. Now we're at the full speed of the airplane. See how the spike comes back, doubles the opening, and compresses it down here. We have to control the air around the engine inlet to be able to transition from a subsonic airplane, transonic, to a clearly supersonic. So we have places where we take the air that's no longer usable and dump it overboard. Or we take it around the engine and dump it in the back to help with cooling. This is probably the most critical piece. It's the face of the compressor to make sure that we have the right pressure that the compressor blades can grab and pass through the engine. And this is to take, again, excess air pull it so we don't have too much air again at that compressor phase. This is at sea level, 14.7. Everything is closed up because we're not getting enough air into the engine. Now we get up to 3.2 Mach, and you can see at 2.2 Mach, the engine is producing 73% of the thrust that's moving you forward. Only a small effect is ram. At the total speed, 83% of the thrust is being produced by the ram, and the engine's only producing 17. It's kind of like an air pump. It has to run, but it's producing very little of the overall effect. This is where it is. It really exists. I was out in that area last October. It's this little box right here. It's a great spot, 560 square miles, surrounded by some of the most desolate land you can imagine. It's a perfect place to test airplanes and test other things. It uh, was created to test the U-2. It tested the A-12, the YF-12A, the SR-71, the F-117, and uh, I don't know all the projects, but the projects are being tested still there today. You can see Las Vegas is down here. It's not that far away. This is a funny story about this. This is the first A-12. It was assembled at Burbank, taken apart, put in a crate. This is, you can't see the label. It's hard to see. It says Acme Oil Company. And they're transporting it to Area 51 to start the test program. California Highway Patrol is leading them along. And we have an accident going up the, the vine heading to Palmdale. <laughs> It wasn't a serious accident, but they got the guy and said, how much money do you need? Do not report this. This is Acme Oil Company. Name a price. So they gave him cash that night to fix his car when he eventually got to where he was going and to keep his mouth quiet about the transport of these airplanes. This is what the fleet looked like of the A-12. You notice the second one here. This is called the, the Titanium Goose. That is the trainer. The instructor pilot 
All these airplanes, oh, those are, these are single seat, single pilot. The instructor pilot sat here and had light controls from the pilot down below. And that's how you did the training, per se. The SR-71 had the same type of arrangement to do our training. Our training, this is our trainer. You can see the elevated rear cockpit. This is where Joe Kennego, who some of you heard earlier, and myself would sit with the student in the front. Or, once a year, we had a flight check ride. So there'd be an instructor pilot in the back, and we would fly a mission, typically a four-and-a-half-hour mission for our check flight. And this is uh, coming over the mountains of Southern California. You can see when we were home, we'd fly the SR about three times a month, go in the simulator about once. And the wonderful thing, we flew the T-38 trainer about uh, eight times a month when we were home. These are the responsibilities. Uh, this picture was taken one night when we were waiting for the go orders from Washington, D.C. I was about to overfly Cuba, and uh, we couldn't launch until we got the go-ahead from Washington. We already talked about the pilot and the NAV. You can kind of see the different responsibilities. There are no flight controls in the back seat. So if the pilot becomes incapacitated, the only option the reconnaissance systems officer had is talk loudly and try to wake the pilot up or use his ejection seat. These are Gemini suits, that's my original navigator. We flew together for four years. John Murphy, the suits weigh about 45 pounds. We had two suits. One was white. Normally, the Air Force would only allow us to be filmed or pictures taken in the white suit. We just happened to be beside an airplane, and a friend took this for us. You can see if we ejected 85,000 feet, which happened to a test pilot, you free fall, takes you eight to 10 minutes, down to 15,000 feet. At 15,000 feet, the, shoot, the seat kicks you out, the chute automatically inflates, and it takes you about 1,000 a minute for every 1,000 feet you have to lose. So if you're in Colorado, it's probably going to take you uh, eight to 10 minutes. If you're in Virginia, for the most part, it's probably going to be pretty close to the 15 minutes. You see down here, there's stirrups, and Lockheed always liked those. We had cables on our feet, so if we did eject, one of the first things that happened, those stirrups, the cables pulled our legs against the seat to make sure that our legs did not hit the canopy on the way out. This was our replacement suit, the 1030. It weighs 45 pounds. You come in through the back. The helmet weighs an additional 10 pounds. has a dual oxygen system and the gloves. This is a parachute harness we had with it. This is where the vent air comes in. Here we can inflate the suit. On the longer flights, you can imagine you're sitting in this suit and some of the air doesn't get to some places you'd like. So you can inflate the suit so you kind of look like the Pillsbury Doughboy. And you can lift yourself up a little bit and let the air circulate all the way around you. If you land Excuse me. If you land in the water unconscious, this automatically inflates and lifts your head up to your anti-suffocation valve. Your shoes are a little bit bigger because you're in a, in a suit. Our checklists were Velcroed because you don't want anything that tightens around your leg that could cut your blood circulation and cause pooling. And the same thing, you want to vent air, the cooling air, to get down to those parts of your, your body per se. On our sleeve down here, if you ejected, these are instructions on what you're supposed to do on the way down. I, I think that the guys that ejected had other things in their mind other than reading their sleeves. Here's the gloves. I often ask people, think about taking your fine cotton gloves you'd wear to church, not take your dishwashing gloves in your kitchen, your rubber gloves, and now go out to the garage and grab your leather gloves. That's these gloves. They're three layers thick. So as you move switches and dish stuff, we tried to do as much as we could by seeing 
because our sense of feel was somewhat restricted, as you can imagine. As a sun visor, I'm here to tell you, at 80,000 feet, you've never seen such a bright sun with the lack of atmosphere up there. So the visor was always down during the day. And with the visor up, for the pilots, it was glass. And we're kind of at the end of the season, but think about in the winter, when you go somewhere in your car, how quickly your breath fogs up that window. Same thing happens in a spacesuit. So that glass visor has a thin gold filament that's heated, and you can feel it against your eyes uh, slightly so you know that the heater's working, because otherwise it would fog up and in very short order you couldn't see. This is the only thing we carry, our only sense of identity on our left shoulder, uh, indicating we were military members of the United States Air Force. The funny thing also, they made us carry 50 cents, so in case we landed away, we could make a phone call. <laughs> what can I say? Once you'd flown an operational mission, you were now allowed to wear this patch. During the history of the program, only 85 pilots and 85 navigators over the 25-year period ever flew operational missions for the six presidents we supported. Why is it called Habu? Because in Okinawa there was a very deadly snake that looked like a cobra. And think about it, when the airplane takes off, you're going to talk more about it here, it climbs up so it kind of looks like a cobra. Because the nose comes up very high as you're accelerating. So the Okinawans said that airplane looks like our poisonous snake, the Habu, and the name stuck because the Air Force never named it. Anybody associated with the program wore this patch, our tankers, our maintenance, our photo, any kind of a role, they wore that Mach 3 patch. This is kind of show you how small the map. This is a record flight, London. Los Angeles, three hours and 47 minutes, two refuelings. I'll have to tell you a funny story about this flight, though. When they turned over Los, over Los Angeles, we can't control where the shock goes. And sometimes in turns, the shock would intensify. In this particular day, they broke windows in about 20 houses in the uh, area of West Hollywood. Well, one of the houses was Azagabur. So the Air Force would thought, we just set a speed record. Why don't we do something special? So they sent down Buck Adams, Bill McCork, the crew with their wives. They arrived at Zaza Gabor's house, and I imagine the butler came out. But you know who we invited in? The crew members. The lady sat in the car for an hour and a half until she was through talking to them. I guess Zaza was always Zaza. The day before we do the mission planning, it was done by computers, there was a whole team. When you're doing 35 miles a minute, you can't go to a, a room and start stripping maps. That was a team's uh, job. The day of the flight, you came in two and a half hours early. You had a physical before every flight. You had to pass the physical. There was always a backup crew ready to take your airplane, because it took a lot of work to get these airplanes ready. You then had a High protein, low bulk meal, steak and eggs. Hour 15 prior, you go down, you put on cotton long johns like you see here. There's a technician, a man or woman on either side of you. The suit is laying on the floor. You pull it off over like a coverall. So I'm about, I got my arms in, I'm about to duck my head through the rain, and you'll see me stand up. I mean, I'm not standing up. They're going to start zippering up the seals and starting to check things. They'll then hook up. We're going to do a communication check. We're going to inflate the suit, make sure it's not leaking, check the dual oxygen system, make sure the face heat works, do all the things that need to be done. The biggest point of leaks was normally the seal around your glove handle. It was a tough seal for them to get it completely closed. They inflated you. You look like the Pillsbury Go Boy. And that young man back there that likes our good tea too, we, about a third of the time we had classes in there watching us suiting up. And the boys particularly would like to come over and beat on the suit because they thought, it, it's got to be spongy. 
an inflated spacesuit actually doesn't give very much. It would be, you should see the looks on some of these boys', boys faces when their fists bounced off. This is me standing in, the, in front of the aircraft. My longest time in a suit was 13 hours, and I was glad to give it back. Most of the time, our flights were two and a half to four and a half hours. My longest flight was 10 hours and 20 minutes. Uh, as you see me standing here, you could stand like that for about five or 10 minutes, and then you needed cooling because you're basically, the suit itself had a nylon layer. The next layer was rubber because this thing had to inflate. The layer beyond that looks like a fishnet. And then the outer layer was a material called Fipro. It's good to 800 degrees. Many firemen use it today. You can't stay in the fire, but it can buy you some precious time per se. Uh, to get out of a fire if you've gotten yourself in the jam. Later on, when the shuttle astronauts flew the first four missions on Columbia, which were test flights, they borrowed our suits. Well, you know they never returned them. There's eight suits out there somewhere that uh, the astronauts used. I can't imagine. See, they hadn't designed their own suits yet. But you can get out of the suit by yourself, but you can't get into it by yourself which meant those eight astronauts stayed in those suits for almost two days because they couldn't come out of them because they, then they couldn't get back into them and they were testing Columbia to see if it was ready for space work. You get up to the cockpit, you put your arms on the rail, there's a technician on either side, they install you in the airplane, your parachute, your oxygen, your ejection system, your communication, all that, and you're watching them extremely professional group of men and women who took very good care of us. The engines, because they weighed 6,000 pounds, took a lot of uh, momentum to get them going. So we tied together a pair of Buick Wildcat engines with a drive shaft that went up. And it sounded like you were going to a drag race because you hear these just screaming engines uh, to get the engines up to a speed where you could then uh, start them. My wife was around this airplane closer before I was. We were living in Japan, and she came home, and she was horrified. Because you had to be a volunteer for this program. You had put in your, your medical, your, your personnel, your flight records. And she said, that airplane is dangerous. It's leaking fuel all over the floor. And the people working on it are wearing raincoats. Sometimes that happens. But again, this fuel was not flammable. One of the biggest problems we had with our people is make sure they didn't slip and fall. And they would police up the fuel afterwards and they'd burn it on the base as heating fuel because then we couldn't use it. But think about it. The airplane would grow three to four inches in length, 600 degrees average. You couldn't use rubber liners, so they couldn't seal the tank. They used silicone as best they could. But every 100 hours, the tanks had to be open, the old silicone taken out, and new silicone put in to hopefully keep the leaks to the minimum. You see the lifting body here. You see what a small profile. That's why the airplane had so little drag and could fly at those kind of speeds. On takeoff, it's the greatest sense of speed. You come out there. You're cleared to take off, you get on the runway, you release the brakes, you light the two afterburners, and within 20 seconds, you will have gone 4,500 feet. You're now lifting off doing 240 miles an hour, and you'll cross through 20,000 feet in less than two minutes from the time you release your brakes. If you go all the way to 80,000 feet, it takes you 17 minutes more. But let's think about it for a second. You're at 20,000 feet, you're doing 400 miles an hour, approximately. You're going to climb 60,000 feet and accelerate to 2,150 miles an hour. So you're climbing and accelerating at the same time. Quite an achievement. These are all the different cameras. This is a big nose camera, 72 miles wide. The side cameras, uh, radar, the defensive systems. We could pick up signals from radars or transmitters about 325 miles anywhere around us. The side cameras, when you got out of your cars today, 
and I flew over, and let's say you're holding that little information sheet that was out there, just a standard piece of paper. I'll fly over 85,000 feet, 35 miles a minute. I will take your picture. Back in the 70s, when we developed the film, I would see each and every one of you. I could identify adult males and adult females. I can't recognize your faces. But most of the time, I could tell you what kind of a car you were driving. That's why the presidents like the film we brought back, because of the clarity of it. They could identify what the targets look like and what they should, should be of a concern. This kind of shows you this is that 72 mile wide picture, 36 either side. This camera here is the one I can see you standing by your car. I can reach it out to about 30 miles either side. It's best out to about 20 miles. Radar I can look at almost to 100 miles either side of us. And electronically, I can look at about 325 uh, miles per se. Coming down for refueling, as I told you, you have to start back about 200 miles, takes 10 minutes. This is the air refueling receptacle. There's a little glass navigation window. This is where the receptacle goes in. You pull up behind your tanker. See here, this is our standard tanker. The boom operator, he or she is laying on a couch. They fly this down to you. One of the things we were first in, we, we don't have to talk to the tanker. We can talk through the boom. The outside world doesn't hear anything. They transfer 1,000 gallons a minute to us. Refuelings were 10 to, uh, were 12 to 15 minutes long, typically. He's doing as fast as he can go, and we're going as slow as we want to go. As he transfers fuel to us, he accelerates to his maximum speed at 25,000 feet. Even with that, sometimes we'd have to light, light an afterburner per se because we just didn't have enough power. Most of the time, there was more than one tanker because they're always concerned, what if a tanker can't give you fuel? My longest mission, 10 hours and 20 minutes, Northern California, a presidentially directed mission, to the north coast of Russia. I took off at uh, 10 o'clock at night. I refueled off of three tankers in Idaho, three more tankers over Goose Bay Labrador, three more tankers north of the Arctic Circle that came out of England, three more tankers out of England coming back. And then the tankers that refueled me in Goose Bay had landed, they had refueled and they came back up to refuel me again. So 10 hours and 20 minutes. 15,000 miles and 72,000 gallons of fuel is what we consumed on that particular mission. The tankers would be stacked side by side. We'd come from one tanker. Typically, it'd take us less than 30 seconds to leave this tanker, to hook up with this tanker, to hook up with the next tanker. We refueled almost every flight. Refueling was just part of our life. This is what you see from the pilot's window. This is the center line. This here tells you, the lights here, it says go forward. The lights here, you're too far forward, come aft. You can see the light, I'm where I'm supposed to be. If the light's here, I'm too high, come low. If I'm down here, I'm too low, bring the light back here. During the day, we didn't use them that much. At night, in the weather, this was absolutely critical to keep our position for the boom operator. Come into land, you touch down to 175 miles an hour, you throw out this huge drag chute, it feels like somebody reached out of the sky. Because without the drag chute, it takes 10,000 feet to stop the aircraft. When this drag chute comes out, you stop at four to 5,000 feet and, and reduce a lot of wear and tear on the airplane and on the uh, braking system. The brakes are still overheated. So the first thing that happens, they put fans on the uh, tires to hope they can uh, keep them from deflating. This is how the sensors come out there and come back. They come out in the dolly. Oop. They come out in the dolly. It's got the whole piece that goes up into the aircraft. They hook up the power and the air conditioning. The film's in here. That's that camera that I can see you standing beside your car. We land. They put it in the dolly, take it back into the processing room. In the dark room, the film is cut into 500 foot lengths with cotton surgical gloves. 
If it's a color, if it's a black and white film in a red light, if it's color film in total darkness, you go through the whole film to make sure there's no tears or nicks or anything else before you put it in the processor. And imagine if you have that nose camera and you have 10,500 feet of film. When I flew in the Middle East for President Carter, that's the camera we had, and I think we shot pretty close to 10,000 feet of film on the mission. These are the different areas we worked out of and where our points of interest were. I'm only one of two pilots that ever went to Diego Garcia. I'm here to tell you it's a little island in the middle of the Indian Ocean, almost a thousand miles from anywhere. So you better find that island because there's really no other, no other place to go. This will show you a typical mission during Vietnam. Okinawa up here, they refuel, they come down, they fly over North Vietnam, Laos, down, they would fuel down in, the, down in the Gulf of Thailand, come back up, follow the route, back up, you can see two refuelings, 5,600 miles, about four and a half hours. During the Arab-Israeli War in 1973, the Europeans would not allow us to fly out of Europe to collect information for our president and for Western leaders. So they had to fly in from the east coast of the United States. They were the longest missions flown in an airplane, anywhere from 10 and a half to 11 and a half hours. So you come out of the east coast, cross multiple refuelings, five or six refuelings, into the Middle East, and then all the way back. Then the film was picked up by Eastman Kodak, speed process, and delivered to our president. It was the SR-71 film that basically all the key decisions our president made on what was going on in the Middle East because our satellites were not positioned correctly. I wish I could, this is a fourth generation. If I had the original film, you could actually see the stripes. You can see a little bit of the stripes, but you can see people walking in. Uh, unfortunately, I can't get the original photography. It's still classified for some reason. This is the wing patch. Today they're flying U 2s, and you probably heard about Global Hawks, the unmanned vehicle that looks as, it's as big as a U 2. And they fly them in the Middle East, they fly them uh, around Korea. We're still trying to learn how to fly vehicles that don't have people in them. Our squadron was the first squadron, the oldest U.S. military squadron in existence. Today it's still a U 2 squadron, so it continues its great legacy as an aviation squadron. This is the last picture. When they were retired in 1990, somebody had the great idea because we normally had 10 SR-71s operational out, and in the back, one trainer. This was at Beale Air Force Base. And why would they retire? It wasn't that they had a competitor. Even today, they don't have a competitor. The Cold War was over. They were looking for a peace dividend. They thought it would be a more peaceful world. The airplane system was costing $85,000 an hour to operate. When I flew them in the 70s, it was $50,000. By the 1990, it was $85,000. But the last reason that was not often talked about, which I think is actually more important, because I bet almost everybody in the room here has an iPhone, a draw Android, and what do you do? You come out of this short little talk, you go in the museum, you take a picture, and you happen to have a friend that's visiting in Japan. So what do you do? You clip it, and you send it half the world away in a minute. When I flew the SR-71 in the Middle East for President Carter, and he monitored all the way we went, from England all the way in and back. When I landed back in England, they downloaded the cameras and the sensors put it on a waiting airplane, flew it across the Atlantic, processed it in Washington, D.C., and then delivered it to our waiting president. I think everybody can appreciate you know, we all live in that world today because he probably didn't get the, the film that we had taken, I'm guessing, 24, 36 hours after my backseater and I had been in the Middle East collecting it. So I think that was actually a larger determinant on... Uh, why the airplane was retired. In closing out, I just want to tell you one little quick story. Uh, again, thank you for supporting this wonderful museum and the activities here. I think the speed display and the speed area 
interactive things for the kids is absolutely fabulous. When I flew in the Middle East, it was a uh, quick reaction, presidentially driven. We left Northern California pretty quickly. As I left, my wife, she knew I was going to the East, but she didn't know what, what the particulars were because it hadn't gotten in the paper yet what the real problem was. And she said, as usual, I don't want to hear about you on television or read about you in the paper. And I said, me too. So I got over there. It turns out that they were leaving. The senior crew was taking the airplane over. It was going to be a three-mission package. Uh, missions were nine hours and 45 minutes. The senior crew did not particularly like to fly longer missions. They were more the four-and-a-half-hour home-for-a-cocktail uh, type of routine. So they convinced me very easily, you take the first mission, I'll take the second mission, you take the third mission, and then we'll fly the airplane home, and we'll all end up with about the same amount of time. On Sunday, the colonel, I was a major at the time, tried to find me. He talked to my little daughter, who was at home, and said, this is Major Carpenter's residence. Do you know where your dad is? He's not home. I don't know where he is. Can you take a message? No, I can't take a message. So he asked her one more time. Can you take a message? She said no. So she did say something. Three nights later, our tankers are where they need to be. England, two sets of tankers in Cairo. Set of tankers, two sets of tankers in Sevilla, Spain. That'll be our refuelers. It's five refuelers. It's the first time the British have ever allowed us. So our deputy ambassador is there. The head of MI5 and MI6, the two top intelligence agencies of Britain, the two-star general in charge of operations for Strategic Air Command, plus many other military dignitaries. I won't go through the whole briefing. We get through. One of the Brits said, what does your family know about this? I looked at my back seat and we both said, oh, we keep it very low key. You know, they know we fly an airplane, but we really don't get into it. About that time, the colonel says, no, wait a minute, Buzz. I got something to share with you. I called the house. And I said, well, oh, my, my daughter. Yeah, oh, yes, yeah. she said, Major Carpenter's house. But I asked her where you were. She didn't know. I asked her if she could take a message, and she said no. I think this is my seven-year-old daughter at the time. So we asked her one more time, and in a very whispery voice, she says, I think he's out spying. <laughs> I looked at my back seat and I said, well, security's been compromised. I guess this is our last flight. So we try to keep the families, you know, as isolated as possible for safety. Thanks for attending, and uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed my time with you.